Um, as Kenneth introduced us, uh, my name is Jeff Squires. I work at Cisco, and uh, my co-presenter today is Ralph Castain, who uh, works at Intel. And we both do quite a bit of development on OpenMPI. I didn't quite understand how much until he said those statistics, but there you go. Uh, it's uh, both a labor of love and uh, at least somewhat paid for by our employers as well uh, to varying degrees. But that also represents uh, quite a bit of the entire OpenMPI community. There's an entire community. This is not the Ralph and Jeff show. We are the ones giving this presentation today, but there are countless other really smart, dedicated people who uh, are, are integral to making OpenMPI be uh, a great project and great software for the world to use. Um, we, the two of us, absolutely could not make this product on our own. So I, I just do want to emphasize that. GitHub may say we have the most commits, but <laughs> that quantity, not necessarily quality. There's a lot of really smart people who may only have 20 commits, but they've uh, you know, contributed really, really important stuff. So I uh, just want to make sure we're, we're clear on that part. Um, uh, as Kenneth also mentioned, this is uh, done in conjunction with the Easy Build community. Kenneth is the one who invited us and kind of gave us this idea. And over the past couple months, we've been fleshing out how to do this talk. So we want to thank him for all of his support and hopefully giving what will be very useful information to the community. So let's talk a little WebEx uh, logistics here. Uh, as I mentioned, this session is being recorded. It will be uploaded to YouTube after the fact. So stay tuned. We'll send all those details later. Um, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A panel. If you've been on a WebEx presentation before, this might be a slightly different format. This is what's called a WebEx event, where it's uh, there are three of us panelists, and we can do the presenting. It's not like your normal WebEx meeting where anyone can talk and all those kinds of things like that. So there is a dedicated panel. If it didn't pop up for you automatically, go ahead and go find it where you can ask questions in text form. Uh, Ralph and Kenneth are watching that while I'm speaking and, and we'll be monitoring it and answering questions and things like that. So let's get on to the agenda here. Um, we actually have, when Ralph and I were making up all these slides, uh, we discovered we have a lot of material. It's a deceptively small overview, um, but there is a truckload of slides here. Um, we're not gonna get through all of it in this first presentation. This a whole presentation, I should say, uh, the overview, this is not an in-depth tuning analysis of OpenMPI or an in-depth how does the system work. This is what are all the parts and pieces because frankly, the title does kind of say it all. HPC has become an alphabet soup of acronyms and different components and you need them all to work together uh, to actually get a functioning system and then actually tune it a bit to actually get a nicely working system. So what the scope of this talk is, is what are all of these pieces? What do these acronyms mean? How do they work together? And we might use this as a springboard for future talks for things like tuning and stuff like that. But just given that the ecosystem has evolved over time, we should actually give a snapshot of where we are today. As developers, we're intimately familiar with all of how these components pieces interact and whatnot, but the rest of the user community, it moves so fast, it can probably be pretty hard to keep up with all this stuff that happens behind the scenes. So that's what we're doing today. Um, our next session we've already scheduled is going to be Wednesday, July 8th. And I know that hits a bit of the um, summer vacation uh, time frame for Europe, uh, especially. I'm sorry about that. That's just how the scheduling worked out, but it's going to be in exactly the same time slot. So uh, for those of you following along at home, that's 11 a.m. U.S. Eastern. I cannot do the time translations in my head for the rest of it. Please translate for your local time, um, but they will be uploaded and available on YouTube afterwards. You won't be able to ask questions, obviously, um, but the content will be there. Um, I've done so much talking here, I'm not going to read through the overview. I assume all of you have done that. Let's just launch straight into the background. All right, OpenMPI is fundamentally based on something that we call the Modular Component Architecture, or MCA. You'll hear the phrase MCA and see it on the MPI Run command line in a lot of places. It's basically a plug-in architecture. It's fancy schmancy words for plug-in. Now, it's an architecture, it's not necessarily a layering, and I'll explain that in the next slide here. But three key words that are important to know is project, framework, and component. Let's look at that real quick here. This is how the architecture is laid out. 
And again, this is not layering. So it doesn't mean that if you start up in the top box with an MPI send, you don't necessarily have to go through every one of those bubbles before you finally hit the underlying network. It's more about how the code is organized, not necessarily how we optimize uh, and get short code paths for fast uh, and message transmission and low latencies and things like that. But at the top, you know, the very, very top, we have the OpenMPI overall project. Underneath that, we have a couple of projects. I'm sorry, I used a poor word a moment ago. I should say the OpenMPI software package. And then below that, we have projects. And then in a project, there are frameworks. And then in a framework, there are components. What does that mean? Well, let's put some concrete examples here. Now, this is not a comprehensive list of all the projects, frameworks, and components that are in OpenMPI, but it's a good representative and some of these uh, words may be familiar to you. So the projects that we have are MPI, Shmem for Open Shmem, and Opal, which is our open portable access layer. It's a lot of the portability glue between BSD, Linux, and other operating systems that used to be important like Solaris and, and things like that. It's a lot of our portability junk down, down below. The frameworks may also be somewhat uh, familiar to you, and we'll discuss these things later in the presentation, like PML and BTL and MTL, things like that. And then down below that is individual plugins that target a specific system. So BTL, uh, again, we'll talk about this in detail later, but that's our byte transfer layer. And we have a TCP layer, we have a shared memory component, we have a US NIC component, which is mine. Um, and so on and so on. So these are the end of the bottom layer, uh, a synonym for the word component could be plugin. So if plugin makes a little more sense to you, then just put that in your brain as like, oh, that's the TCP plugin or the shared memory plugin or the US NIC plugin and so on. Now, this is the overall semantic view of how OpenMPI looks. Um, and I will say that the OpenMPI community has proven to be absolutely terrible at naming things. Uh, we are engineers, we are not necessarily literature scholars, and so several times we have just kind of thrown up our names, or thrown up our hands and said, you know what, we're just going to pick a Star Wars themed name for this one. You'll see names like Obi-Wan and Vader and a couple others, and unfortunately Vader is really terrible because it's very common, it's actually the shared memory transport. So we say, oh, yes, you need to use uh, shared memory, so use Vader. And people are like, what? So that is unfortunately a very not user-friendly word. I apologize for that. A um, couple other names have leaked in over the time, too. Uh, there's some Star Trek names. There's some Highlander names. Um, it just reflects that we are geeks and terrible at naming things, and I apologize for that. So with that, I am going to turn this over to Ralph, and Ralph is going to talk about uh, PIMIX. So Ralph, I'm going to stop presenting. And I'm going to let you present. Okay, let's see. Uh, now I need to figure out how to do that, Jeff. So let me... <laughs> <laughs> in the I, WebEx uh, window, if you hover over the bottom, the little guy with the up arrow. Guy with the up arrow. Uh, so it's a bubble uh, with a box and an up arrow in the main WebEx window. I don't have one, Jeff. Um, if you, okay, let's do this. Sorry, everybody. We tested this but it was like two weeks ago. I think we forgot. Sorry. I have to give you presenter privileges. Go ahead, Ralph. There we go. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, I can't see this. So I don't know how well this is, what is what's being displayed. Uh, is this covering? Click on that present button in the top right button. In there the we top. go. Yeah, that'll help. Thanks, All sir. right, there we go. My apologies, guys. Um, like Jeff said, I and Kenneth said, I, I am the one who basically uh, started PMIX. Oh gosh, back in uh, 1990. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, uh, 2014. Uh, basically, what happened was we were in, in the process of looking at the exascale uh, emerging uh, machines, and and one of the things we we found in looking at it. I'm having some issues here with this, uh, with the presentation mode there, Jeff. How odd. Okay. My apologies again, folks. So one of the things we were looking at was um, how are we going to deal with some of the things we were seeing that were uh, kind of going on in the HPC community uh, 
in particular, we were seeing that there was not just an, an emphasis on on the uh, scale of the machines, you know, going up to the exascale kind of size, both in terms of number of nodes and number of processes uh, growing up like to the million process level and stuff. Um, but also we were seeing a lot of things going on where, with programming models and other such things. And we were trying to figure out, you know, well, how does one machine support all this stuff? And, uh, and how are we going to make it all work efficiently together? So, um, so we took a look and we said, okay, so if we look at the, the, some of the key issues here, if we're looking at just, you know, MPI, parallel jobs in general, we started seeing issues about how long is it going to take to start them? Uh, we get to these bigger scales. Um, we were looking at times it might be like in the tens of minutes to actually start up a full scale job. And that, that obviously was not acceptable. So we figured we had, all right, we need to look at this launch scaling issue. But at the same time, we had the applications changing where there were going to be multiple models involved in application. You know, I showed two here, the OpenMP and the MPI models. But there are others as well. You know, you might have Spark, for example, that's, that then wants to use MPI in it for a reduction mechanism. And there are moves being made of, on the artificial intelligence, the machine learning guys starting to look at using MPI and other kind of uh, uh, models like OpenShmem for, for some of their uh, operations. So we had to feel, well, how are we going to deal with these, these hybrid applications? We also saw a proliferation showing, uh, 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 occurring of, of model specific tools, I'll call it. You know, people writing their own tools that would work with, say, um, like a debugger, for example, that would only deal with MPI and a debugger that would only deal with, with uh, data analytics. Uh, and that seemed really inefficient that everybody had to rewrite all those, all those tools just to be able to deal with a different programming model. Same time, we saw, uh, you know, the emergence of container technologies. Uh, Kenneth mentioned I was involved in the, in the early days of Singularity. Uh, Docker also has, has shown, as well as several others. Um, and those presented their own problems. Um, if an application is sitting inside a container, uh, if you want to wire up those containers, it has to interact with the outside uh, environment. Well, well how is it going to do that across a container boundary? And what do you do about uh, you know, changes at the at the model level. If you, or, or, I'm sorry, at the at the host level, somebody does a version upgrade. Um, you know, how does he, how do you do the, deal with the container not doing that? Um, and then finally, we just saw you know this explosion of of, of programming models. I, I list some of them them up there, but the uh, every one of those has its own runtime, and if you you look at the effort required to run, uh, to, to write a runtime, it, it's really rather staggering. Everybody tends to underestimate it. But, uh, you know, all these runtimes, we're doing basically the same thing with a minor twist, perhaps, between the different programming models. But a great deal of effort was being spent on all these runtimes. And, and so the question was, well, is there a way maybe we can make that easier? or perhaps reduce the need for, for generating all these new runtimes. And if, if, if where we do need new runtimes, well, how are they going to work with each other in, a, in an HPC cluster? So we decided to start someplace. And the first place we decided to go was, uh, to work was that we were going to address this launch scaling problem. Um, for those who aren't familiar with how these launches work, uh, you start all your processes, and then in a parallel job uh, in particular, you then do a, a great global uh, um, all gather, if you will, where you share a lot of information about you know, what connection endpoints am I listening on, where am I operating, um, you know, just a ton of information. It's amazing how much information it is on a large scale system, uh, you may be exchanging uh, tens of megabytes of information during this uh, initial startup exchange. So if you if you hit, you know, MPI run my job and you sit there for 10 or 20 seconds uh, waiting for, for any indication of life, uh, that's what's going on is this massive exchange uh, of information. If you if you drill down and analyze that information, what you discover is that 
almost all of it was already known to the launcher uh, before it even started the processes. It knew where they all were. It knew what hosts they were assigned to. It knew where they were gonna be bound. Um, and it just didn't have a way of communicating that information down uh, to the application at the time uh, the application started. So, um, so that, that was an inefficiency that could easily be addressed. The other problem was uh, that we were dynamically uh, discovering the endpoints for every one of these processes. So uh, even though I might know where the process was, I didn't know how to communicate to it. In a, in a TCP-like world, I didn't know what socket you were listening on because you dynamically picked it up. And so I still had to do the exchange of at least the endpoint information. But it turns out that if you work with the fabric vendors, there are ways they can assign those endpoints in advance so that you actually know what they, what the, what socket, if you will, I'll use that as just a, a simple example that, that we can talk to. I, I can pretty much assign a socket in advance and know what socket you're actually gonna be talking on and communicate that to everybody so that everybody at time of, of start of execution knows exactly where every process is and what every process uh, endpoint is. So when I want to communicate, I can just communicate. I don't have to do any exchange of information in order to do it. So, uh, so that's what we decided we would tackle, and that was our first goal: was just to completely eliminate the data exchange at startup, and uh, and then expand upon that eventually to actually allow uh, the resource manager in opera in co collaboration with the programming libraries, basically to orchestrate the entire launch procedure. So our, our tool for doing this was going to be PMI. Um, this is kind of the, the legacy or the history of the, uh, of the uh, PMI effort, if you will. Back in the early days, uh, there was PMI 1 and PMI 2 that came out of the MPISH project. And that basically just concentrated on wire up support. So it was the mechanism by which you did that big global exchange of information at the beginning of time. Uh, it then expanded out a little bit to offer things like, you know, well, if I want to spell, you know, do a comp spawn, if you will, if I want to spawn a few more processes dynamically from inside my application, well, we had a mechanism for doing that and stuff. But it basically was limited. Its primary focus was strictly on that initial wire up, um, and so it was picked up by uh, by PGAS and a few other uh, programming models. Interestingly enough, it was not actually picked up by OpenMPI when we picked, when we started. We went a different route, um, and the uh, it was picked up by two resource managers, the Slurm uh, guys, and then the Cray Alps system wrote libraries to support it. But it was kind of restricted. Uh, it wasn't a standard in that sense that uh, there was a standard body over it or anything like that. But for a long time, that's what people used. Uh, and then, like I said, late 2014, we started looking at, at what we were going to do to try and deal with exascale because we didn't think that the time uh, wire up times were going to be acceptable. And about 2016, somewhere in 2015, we released our first version of PMIX. Um, and by 2016, we were able to uh, launch exascale size systems in, in under 30 seconds. So we went from the tens of minutes to under 30 seconds. At that point in time, um, PMIX started getting picked up by uh, some of the uh, more of the libraries, if you will. So uh, the resource managers, Slurm had picked it up. IBM wrote a, a new resource manager called Job Step Manager for their Coral machines here in the United States. Uh, they based it on PMIX. Uh, obviously, OpenMPI and Spectrum MPI out of uh, IBM were using it, as was OpenSchmim. Uh, a variety of flavors of OpenSchmim were using it at that time. By the time we get to this year, we're now uh, have exascale launch times that are under 10 seconds. Uh, they're running somewhere in the five to seven second range. Um, we have a much broader scope of, of PMIX uh, that I'll get into over to, over the uh, two sessions we've got scheduled. And uh, and we're up to like version four of PMIX. So uh, resource managers now, 
everybody except uh, Unova's Grid Engine uh, are using it. I, I don't know the state of Unova Grid Engine. I have not officially heard from them that they are using it, that they have, have uh, added support for it, but everybody else has. Um, we now have been, it's been adopted by MPISH as well as the OpenMPI community. Uh, all of the uh, open SHMEMs are use, have, have support for it. Uh, PGAS has support. Uh, on the tool side, TotalView and DDT uh, both now have built-in PMIX support, et cetera. So it has really grown in its adoption. And the only reason I, I, I show you all these uh, things on here is just to give you a, a, an idea that um, even though we are talking primarily OpenMPI in these two talks, uh, you're going to see PMIX from a lot of different sectors, not just OpenMPI. And so um, uh, you'll see it coming at you from a variety of directions. So PMIX has evolved into three distinct entities out there now. So there is actually a PMIX standard uh, and a standards governing body. Um, it's uh, an international body. Uh, uh, it consists of about well, about 18 different organizations are members of the administrative steering committee. Uh, it meets uh, quarterly for for official votes, and then it has monthly meetings that are just working meetings, and has a variety of uh, working groups now uh, in it that are looking at things like uh, extending into the uh, power supporting power APIs and storage APIs and a variety of other areas that people are interested in extending to. Uh, nothing about implementation in there. It just defines a whole set of APIs. They're very generic APIs and uh, a set of attribute strings by which you control the behavior of the API. Uh, there's there's one major implementation out there, the Open PIMIX library. Um, we haven't really seen uh, an explosion of implementations, so for now, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, Livermore has been working on a uh, uh, potentially working on one that'll be for their flux system but uh, other than that it's pretty much just open PMIX as you'll see out there and uh, uh, and it feature it, it basically is a, a reference implementation for the standard so everything in the standard is in that open, open PMIX library um, we also ran into a case though where people were saying gee whiz you know our, our our uh, resource management environment is not necessarily up to speed on, on uh, PMIX. It's not you know, as current as we might like, uh, but we still want to be able to start working with some of the new features as we move through the various uh, uh, releases. So we, we created a reference runtime environment for, for PMIX called PERTE. Um, and basically PERTE is just, it's a full featured uh, runtime. It, it, it supports all of the PMIX uh, uh, scope, and uh, and you can just run it under your own resource manager. So, for example, you can get a, a slurm allocation and then start Perte underneath that, and then you can just operate your your uh, your MPI job or Open Shmem job or whatever it is, operate it underneath Perte as if Cray had a complete PMIX. Uh, implementation inside it. It won't know that you won't know the difference. So um, the other thing it did was it, it allowed us to provide, for example, for tool vendors uh, that that Perte runs at the user level, and so each user can have their own Perte environment that they can work in. And that way, if you have a bunch of people that wanted to development on the same machine, um, they can each have their own Perte running, and each of those Pertes can have a different version of PMIX that it's running under. Um, and uh, and they can work independent of each other without any interference. So it's being used quite widely in those areas. So this is just real quick what the community is. Uh, there's, as I say, there's quite a few organizations. This was a snapshot in time of about several years ago, really. Um, and I do give you the uh, the, the uh, links at the bottom. The top one is for the is the standard. Uh, body's uh, uh, main web page, and then the bottom one is actually the uh, the GitHub repo for the standard itself. So one of the key things about PMIX, and I'm just going to give you some background in it today so that uh, you understand when we talk about the role of PMIX in OpenMPI, you'll understand a little more about what the heck this thing does. But um, 
PMIX basically is a messenger, uh, not a doer. So in other words, um, when an application says, hey, I'd like to get a new allocation of resources, PMIX doesn't do that allocation. It just communicates your request to the resource manager and the resource manager either will do it or not. And then we PMIX will communicate the answer back to you about what the resource manager did. Uh, likewise, if you are a, a, a user and you're working with a tool that's PMIX based, uh, if you ask us, for example, hey, what, what storage systems are on this on this cluster and what are their capabilities, PMIX normally will not do that uh, request itself. It will simply pass it to, in this case, the storage system and say, hey, they, they asked a question. The storage system will generate the response and then we will convey it back to you. So its basic role in the, in the HPC uh, environment, if you will, is, is to basically convey these orchestration requests, as we call them, uh, and the responses between the application and the system management stack. And there's a wide range of these orchestrations uh, that, that people have asked for, like I say, you know, allocations and job launches and job control and monitoring things, and we'll go over some of these. The other thing, though, that happened was that we, we had the various programming models uh, come to us and say, hey, we have a problem ourselves in terms of coordination within the application. So, uh, you know, I'm, in this case, OpenMP and MPI. Uh, we're both trying to use the, the threads and we step on each other. And we would really like some way of being able to coordinate inside of the application and say, hey, I need you to just set, sit aside for a little while, you know, turn your progress threads off for a little while because I'm in a really intense computational mode, uh, OpenMP computational uh, section here. And it would really be helpful for our performance if the MPI layer just shut down for a little bit. So we created a mechanism by which these, these two pro, multiple programming libraries can in fact interact with each other using PMIX events in an asynchronous fashion to do things like say, hey, I need you to you know, shut your progress threads off for a little bit and then say, okay, I've shut them off, go ahead and do what you want to do. And then when you're done, you send me back an event saying, okay, I'm done, you can go ahead and kick on again. Um, and that's actually been useful for people to, to help uh, resolve some of the resource contentions. So there are some exceptions to that doer rule. Um, when we're interacting with non-PMIX systems like fabric managers or credentials or even in some cases storage systems, um, the the issues that came in with people that people had was uh, at the resource manager level was you're going to pass me up this request as the primary point of contact and you're going to say, hey, uh, tell me what the fabric topology looks like. And in order for me to answer that question, I'm going to have to write a whole bunch of code to talk to the different fabric managers that are out there. And, and that's a lot of work on my part. Uh, why don't you guys take that on for me? So um, we talked amongst ourselves and amongst the various vendors, and we agreed that in some cases, what we would do is rather than the host uh, system management software having to write these particular implementations, we would write them as plugins to PMIX and allow the resource manager, if you will, if they're the host, allow them to call this that API and then we would actually take care of connecting to the other, the actual storage um, uh, system management subsystem and get that information. So in other words, uh, we limit the, the application's connectivity to going just to the host uh, resource manager, daemon or whoever it is that's hosting the PIMIX server. So that's the only connection they have. But when you get to the PIMIX server, we provide plugins that allow it, for example, to say, hey, they asked for information about what fabric topologies are here. I'm going to ask PIMIX to go talk to the fabric manager on my behalf and get that information. Then I'll relay it back to the application. So there are some things, and you'll see them in our, in our, in our MCA layer, uh, in our plugins. You'll see references where we are, in fact, um, 
carrying out some of those things. Like we will have a slingshot plugin to talk to the Cray Fabric Manager, and we will have a Luster plugin to talk to the Luster storage system, where we are in fact executing on behalf of the of the host resource manager. We're executing the request to get that information. The other thing we do is at the server level is we aggregate all local collective operations. So if the application is calling a fence operation, we will collect all the local participants before we pass that up to the uh, to the host for uh, internode uh, uh, execution. And then we do some environment support. You know, we, we, if they ask us to, we will collect inventory for them. Uh, you know, do an HW loc uh, topology uh, collection to find out what NICs and GPUs are present and stuff. We do a little bit of process monitoring for some obvious ones, et cetera. So there's a few things we do, but in general, we don't, we, we just pass requests. So where does it fit? Um, in the open MPI uh, package, it is one of the projects sitting over there off to the side. Um, it has its own set of, of frameworks. Uh, what Jeff uh, didn't mention, but I, I will, is that the the framework. Think of the framework as the um, as the plugin ab abstraction layer. So, if I have a a framework, PTL framework is our <laughs> PMIX transport layer, equivalent to the BTL in 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 uh, OpenMPI itself. What that is basically is just a a, a definition of a set of abstracted interfaces. That each plugin is going to implement, and so uh, PMIX has got a growing number of these. Uh, we do love our uh, our frameworks, and each of those has its own uh, component plugins in them. And I'll be going over those in the second session. Uh, but this uh, concludes the the uh, overview of PMIX I wanted to give you, just to show you that look, there's all. It, it provides a lot, whole host of services that, op, uh, that OpenMPI relies on and is a project that sits off to the side in, inside of OpenMPI. And Jeff, I think that means I'm going to turn this over to you. Uh, can you take presenter, Jeff? Yes, I will give a uh, presenter role to Jeff. Meanwhile, we already have a couple of questions related oh. to uh, PMIX. All right. So maybe yeah. Ralph, you can try to cover them. Let me bring them back. Um, bum, 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 bum. Okay. So the first question is what exactly is meant by Univa Grid Engine not supporting PMIX? Does it mean that OpenMPI will not work with Univa Grid, or does it mean that the startup is not optimal um, with UGE integration? Okay. What that means is that if you want to run uh, with PMIX, uh, P, like op we'll just use OpenMPI for as the example. If you want to run M OpenMPI under uh, Univa Grid Engine, you have to use OpenMPI's MPI run to start the job. You can't. You uh, Univa Grid Engine doesn't support PMIX natively, so you can't use a you know a Q sub command to start your job uh, to start your application. You'd have to use MPI run. And okay. that's in contrast, just to throw in a little extra color here, um, to Slurm, for example, you can start a job with SRUN, but then you can also start your MPI application inside that job with another SRUN, because PIMIX is built into the runtime and that talks natively to OpenMPI behind the scenes. So um, that's what the native integration means versus using OpenMPI's MPI run, where we'll typically use some other mechanism underneath the scenes and it might be a quote unquote native mechanism so even in univa grid engine we're using univa grid engine mechanisms to do the launch but it's not as tight of an integration as if you do a direct launch okay i think we'll also get back to some of the runtime stuff later maybe in the second part right yeah yeah um another question that was raised and this is maybe for jeff uh, who may cover it later is OpenMPI ABI compatible with other MPI libraries, or do we expect it to be in the future? Uh, the short answer is no, but let's get back to that later. Let's do the, the, the PIMIX questions here. Okay. Um, next question is, does the version of Slurm have any effect on the compatibility with PMIX? 
Yes, it does uh, to a limited extent. The um, the versions of Slurm um, support different levels of PM, different versions of PMIX, starting with I believe it was uh, Slurm uh, sixteen dot X uh, was the I think it was sixteen dot five was their first Slurm uh, support. That only supported the version one out of Pimix. By the time you get to Slurm 18.x, they are capable of supporting uh, all the way up through uh, PMIX3. Um, and uh, they are, they've now opened it up so that they can, I, I believe they're now working on, on full integration with PMIX4. That would be coming out probably in late the, the late uh, 2020 release, maybe early 2021. Uh, PMIX supports backward compatibility in its library. So if, if uh, there was a bug in the, in the Slurm configuration script that actually didn't support it, in other words, you could not use uh, PIMIX 3 with a Slurm 16.5, even though it, in fact the PIMIX support would have worked just because they were checking the wrong thing and they would have said, well, it's not PIMIX 1, so we won't let you build against it. They fixed that in uh, 2018. And so um, in 2018, you were able to to go ahead and use an, a like a Slurm, or, I'm sorry, a PIMIX 3 and and build even though they might not, not support the PIMIX 3 uh, APIs, you'd still be able to use it and just use the PIMIX 2 APIs that were in the PIMIX 3 release. So it's, I apologize, it's a little uneven in that sense, but uh, they, they've now fixed the problems. You should be able with anything uh, uh, 2018 or, or, or newer, you should be able to use any of the PMIX releases against it. Yeah, we got a related question um, that we, you may have answered just now. Can one build uh, Slurm against the PMIX included with the OpenMPI sources instead of a separate PMIX source download? Uh, no, uh, not really. Uh, I, I say that a little tongue in cheek. Um, there is a configure option in OpenMPI that will allow you to expose the um, the the headers that you need in order to do that uh, and you could do so uh, and then you'd be able to do it so if you were to build open mpi with the uh, double dash enable devel dash devel dash headers that will uh, put the public headers out for pmix and then if you really wanted to then you'd be able to go ahead and build uh, to use the PMIX that came with OpenMPI. Let me throw a little more color in there too, Ralph. Um, this is a great question. It's really just about build system logistics though, because the PMIX that we ship, whatever version of PMIX that we ship in OpenMPI, you can build Slurm with that. Um, whether you use the copy that's embedded in OpenMPI or if you go download that same version from the PIMIX website. At the end of the day, it, it results in the same thing. There's some shell script build system craziness that we have to go through to expose the internal one uh, externally so that Slurm can build against it. So if that gets too complicated for you, just go download the same version from the PIMIX website and you're effectively getting the, the same thing. Yeah, well, let me emphasize one thing because uh, this may be the root of really of the question, and that is, you don't have to have Slurm and OpenMPI built against the same PIMIX in order for them to work together. The, it, they don't need that at all. Uh, PIMIX is cross-version compatible. The the Slurm uh, PIMIX will will pick up the uh, basically when when they when the client connects to the to the server there's a handshake that goes on that basically exchanges hey i'm running version three you're running version four we select the right communication protocols to to make all that work so slurm can be at version two pimix can be at version four it doesn't matter okay yeah um, it, was, it was done that way specifically for this cross version matrix compatibility nightmare right so because we have all these shifting stacks and things like that so 
Pemex was very specifically designed to allow that cross-version compatibility for exactly what Ralph mentioned. Okay, very good. Um, one more question related to PMIX. Are there known examples of end-user applications, maybe non-MPI applications, using PMIX directly? Uh, yes, there are, uh, and, and they're growing. Uh, I can't, I can't, uh, I apologize, my brain being, uh, I'm being a bit of a fossil here. I, I just, I can't give you a name right this instant off the top of my head. But um, there are quite a few applications that are, are beginning to uh, to do so, um, and there are a number of programming models other than op than uh, MPI that are that are using it, especially in the workflow manager areas. So when you see things like Swift T or, or Balsam or Adios uh, coming out of the national labs over here, uh, we are working with them uh, very closely right now on on integration with PMIX because they want to be able to use the dynamic uh, APIs in in, uh, in PMIX to actually drive different um, you know uh, orchestration behaviors within these different environments so you know one of the issues has always been there if I, if I write a, a nice workflow manager for example that does this great job of of uh, doing computation and visualization for example um, you wind up having to do it for a given environment, like a Cray, for example, but then if I want to move it to something else, I wind up having to rewrite a whole bunch of it in order to drive a different type of system. Um, and so PMIX gives you that abstraction so you don't have to do that. So these guys are moving pretty aggressively in that direction. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one more question. Is it sufficient to use PMI2 rather than PMIX for a medium-sized cluster? So the context is about 10,000 cores and largest, largest job being about 2,000 cores. Um, well, you can always use PMI2 versus PMIX. There's no requirement that you can't. The, the issue you'll run into is how long does it take to start the job and then you know whether you want the orchestration capabilities or you're content with just a, a traditional M MPI job. When you're at 2,000 cores, uh, you know, or 2,000 processes, it, you'll you'll notice a slight difference in, in startup times, but not a major one. Uh, that That's, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of on the edge where you start to see a big difference. Um, when you get up into the five or 6,000 process levels, now you're starting to see some significant differences. And when you get up into the tens of thousands of processes, there's a big difference. Kenneth, we lost you there. So I'm going to jump in with the, at the last question we got on PIMIX so far is, does LSF support PIMIX? Uh, the answer, I can't speak for IBM, so I'm going to, you know, this is a little bit uh, off cheek, but the answer is they are, they are going to be, we're working on releasing that. It is not currently released. Okay. All right. That is all the questions we've got on PIMIC so far. Um, so I think we're going to jump in and do the next section, which will be a little tight, but I think we can get it in. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and share. All right, let's talk about building OpenMPI. Um, here's the super short version. Um, we actually take a lot of effort to make sure that this has remained true throughout the entire life of OpenMPI. You download the tarball, you untar it, you CD into the directory, you configure. And you typically give it a prefix, you know, where you want it to install and possibly a bunch of options. And those options typically deal with supplemental libraries like network communications, libfabric, UCX, things like that. Then you make it and a parallel build is fully supported. So you can make dash J as many as you like. I frequently make dash J32, for example. And then you make install and that's it. Um, it's supposed to be as simple as that. Now the, the devil's in the details. So let's get into that a little bit here. Um, there are some exceptions. If you actually do git clone from uh, the OpenMPI GitHub repository, um, you require a few more tools. So we require developers to have things like the GNU Auto Tools, GNU Flex, 
and on master we now require pandoc for generating our man pages um so you got to have these things and we don't feel bad asking for git clones to have these additional tools distribution tarballs you don't need any of these tools because the tarballs themselves are all bootstrapped um there is a file called hacking so if you want to build from a git clone go read that file and it tells you all that you need to know and if it doesn't let us know we'll update the hacking file all right so there is a philosophy to our configure script our configure script is very long and involved um, it looks around your system and it searches for all these optional support dependencies, right? Like, oh, do you have UCX? Oh, do you have libfabric? Oh, do you have this thing? Do you have that thing? If it finds them, it builds support for them. But if it doesn't find them, it just skips them because it's an optional dependency. Now, that being said, if a human specifies on the command line, like, hey, I specifically want this dependency, like dash dash with libfabric, that is telling configure, I need you to build lib fabric. And if you cannot build lib fabric, I want you to abort and let a human figure out what, what the problem is here. Right? So that is an indication of intent with. Now you can also do the opposite of that too, say, like, no, 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 dude, I don't care about lib fabric at all. Do dash dash without lib fabric. Um, and then configure will effectively skip that. Sometimes we'll do some it doesn't really matter, but it effectively skips the lib fabric stuff. So foo uh, applies to a lot of different things. I just use lib fabric as one example, but there's a lot of with and without foo things in our configure system. So the short version is, is if a human asks for something and configure can't do it, we will abort and let you figure out. We will not silently fail and say, oh, you said with lib fabric, but I didn't find it, but that's fine. It's optional. No, when you say with foo, we no longer treat that as optional. That's very important for automation because as we know, um, gremlins creep into the system and you're like, oh, well, I said with lib fabric and something changed and it can no longer find lib fabric and so it can't build lib fabric. You want to know because configure aborted and told you right away, nope, couldn't find lib fabric support. Human, please figure that out. Specifying compilers. Um, we know in the HPC community that the compiler can be tremendously important depending on the type of in, uh, application that you've got. The rule of thumb is that you probably want to compile your MPI implementation with the same compiler suite that you're building your application with. That's not always true. You can mix and match compilers, but really weird wonky stuff can happen when you do that if you're not careful. So. The easiest thing to do is definitely to have like, oh, I'm gonna build my application with the GNU compiler suite. Great, build OpenMPI with the GNU compiler suite. Oh, I'm gonna build my application with the Intel compiler suite. Great, build OpenMPI with the Intel compiler suite. Like I said, you can mix and match, but that is not for the meek. It is, it can get hairy. So the way that you specify which compilers OpenMPI should use is three, these three different uh, shell variables, CC, CXX, and FC. We used to have F77 uh, and F90. Those are no longer used anymore. It is now just FC for the Fortran compiler. So all Fortran code goes through that one compiler, regardless of which flavor or dialect of Fortran it is. Now, the best practice is to actually specify this on the command line to the right of the configure token, like that example I show there. So configure and then CC equals blah, 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 clang. And CXX equals blah, 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 clang, plus, plus. The reason for that is then your entire configure line ends up in the first couple lines of the config.log. So you can look back and see, oh, which compiler suite did I build this with? Versus just having uh, like, you know, you set your path appropriately or you exported CC before you ran configure, then that's not captured in config.log. Yeah, it'll do the right thing, no matter how you set the CC environment variable, but it's best if it's nicely in that config.log. Or I'm sorry, it's not best, it doesn't matter, it works either way, but it's good for your future self if you ever need to go back in that log and recreate how you built OpenMPI there. Now, something that we talk about uh, a little bit is that OpenMPI can be built as both static or shared, or actually both at the same time if you want to. So you can build libmpi.a, or you can build mpi.so, and I'm using Linux uh, library conventions here. The equivalent is true in Mac OS and other operating systems as well. So there is an enable static and a disable static and enable shared and a disable shared. These are configure command line options. Um, 
the default and the recommended is that we disable building the static and we enable building the shared libraries. You can build both at the same time, enable static and enable shared. Sometimes weird things happen there. So our recommended for a variety of reasons is to disable static and enable shared, but you can override either of those defaults on the command line. Now, uh, a more subtle thing is where are the plugins? Where are the components? Are they dynamic shared objects, meaning that we open them at runtime? They're all individual little library files, DSOs. Um, so are they in libmpi or are they outside of it? So this picture here is our default that we have libmpi contains the core code and the frameworks, but all the components are individual DSO files in your file system. Um, that being said, you could do this command line option, disable DL open, and then we actually kind of slurp all those plugins into libmpi. For all intents and purposes, the functionality is the same. Um, the use cases for why we offer it both ways is uh, complicated and convoluted, not really worth going into. The default is the DSO way, but you can say this disable DL open and then it's all included in libmpi. And this is orthogonal as to whether libmpi is a shared library or a static library itself. So you could do DSO included uh, regardless of whether it's a static libmpi.a or a shared library libmpi.so. All right, now, two dependencies that we hear a lot about are libevent and hwlo. We require these two packages. The super short version is libevent is an event-based framework. So we inject stuff into a queue and they get processed and we might put things in and it supports doing timers and uh, do something when a file descriptor fires, uh, things like that. We use that internally inside MPI quite a bit. HWLOC is the hardware locality project, um, mostly out of INRIA in France, um, but they are also a partner open MPI project as well. We require these two packages. They used to be optional, but we finally gave it up and said, no, no, we're gonna need these two. Most modern Linux distros actually come with both of these packages. However, installing the header files is not very common. It usually doesn't happen by default. So you might have to install like libevent dev and hwloc dev or whatever your distro happens to call them. Um, so OpenMPI can build against the you know, operating system provided versions of those packages, or we still embed full copies of these projects inside OpenMPI because of this reason. We got so many bug reports and user complaints saying like, oh, you require libevent and it's installed on my distro, but OpenMPI is failing to build. Well, it was because they hadn't installed the dev uh, package and so therefore the header files were not available. So therefore OpenMPI couldn't compile against it. Um, so we still embed full copies of these packages. Um, if our default is to use the system installed ones if we find them, and we will fall back to using the internal ones if you want. But if you want to force using internal or external, I provide the, the examples down there at the bottom. You can say with hwloc, and you can optionally um, provide a tree where it's installed, or you could say, you know, equals internal, and that's a special keyword that says, no, no, don't even bother looking externally, just use the one internally. Honestly, there's not a whole lot of reason if you have modern versions of lib event and hwloc, and by modern versions, I mean within the last three to four years, you won't notice a whole lot of difference. So most people won't care whether you use the operating system version or the internal one, but I mention this because this question comes up periodically. Now, communication libraries, there's, there used to be a lot of them, um, but now there's, oh, typo on my slide, and I'll fix that before we send these slides around. The most uh, common libraries that we say are libfabric and UCX, but also PSM is, is out there as well. There used to be a lot of communication libraries out there. They have kind of consolidated down to libfabric and UCX these days, and I'll talk about that more in, in a second here. But if your libfabric or UCX or PSM or portals um, are in non-default locations, you might need to specify where the installation directory is. That's what the brackets means, is you can say, oh, with libfabric, and then configure will fail if it can't find libfabric. But you can also say with libfabric equals and a directory, and that's where configure will go search to find libfabric or UCX or PSM2 or portals. 
So let's talk about, this is a, a frequent question. Uh, okay, so we've had a lot of consolidation of lip fabric and UCX, and I'm gonna talk about this more in detail when we get to the MPI layer in the next session, but this is from a build perspective for the moment. So just a little background on OFI and UCX. Um, lip fabric was originally created by a bunch of network vendors who wanted to do operating system uh, bypass and or you know HPC class networking, but not tied to the specific abstractions of InfiniBand. And so there were three initial companies, uh, my own company, Cisco, and Cray, and Intel, they kind of formed the, the first versions of LibFabric. And since then, a whole variety of other network types have been supported by different vendors and third parties as well. UCX um, really became the next generation higher abstraction InfiniBand support. So it supports uh, InfiniBand, Rocky, and actually I just found out yesterday it doesn't support iWarp, so I will remove that from the slide here before we send that around as well. It also grew to support a couple other, so Cray, Eugeni, POSIX TCP sockets, and shared memory as well. So that's kind of the genesis of those two libraries here. This is what it looks like uh, pictorially here. So LibFabric is the bubble on the right, UCX is the bubble on the, on the I'm sorry, LibFabric is the bubble on the left, uh, UCX is the bubble on the right. You can see all the networking types that they uh, individually support, and then they both should also support shared memory and TCP sockets. Now, while OpenMPI can use both LibFabric and UCX because it support, you know, represents a huge wide variety of network types, OpenMPI does not use LibFabric or UCX for pure shared memory or TCP unless you explicitly tell it to. By default, we will use, uh, if you're doing TCP or pure shared memory, we will use internal OpenMPI support for that. Now, there are accelerators too. Um, uh, HPC is all about accelerators these days. OpenMPI has CUDA support. Um, NVIDIA, i.e. Mellanox, since they are now merged, um, recommends building UCX with GDR copy support. So GDR is an acronym that stands for GPU Direct RDMA. There are a couple of different flavors of GPU Direct out there. The one that HPC cares about is this RDMA flavor. So GPU Direct RDMA. So they say, hey, when you build UCX, make sure you include GDR copy uh, in your UCX and you need to consult the UCX documentation about that. I, this is a talk about OpenMPI. I'm not gonna talk about how to build UCX there. Um, but then you build OpenMPI with CUDA and UCX support with the following two command lines. So with CUDA and with UCX, optionally supplying the paths to them if you need to. Now, PSM2 also supports CUDA. Um, now, when you build CUDA support into OpenMPI, the whole point is that OpenMPI can send and receive messages directly from GPU device memory without copying through main RAM. So you basically save on congestion in the box and you also get lower latency. Although latency is not the big deal because usually you're sending and receiving very large messages from your GPU device memory. So latency is not the big deal, but congestion and uh, throughput is more of a win with GPU Direct RDMA. Now, once you have built OpenMPI, there's actually a command that it always surprises me that more people don't know about this command. There's a command called umpi info, umpi underscore info. Yes, by the way, we do say that. That's a thing, umpi, OpenMPI, umpi. Um, that will tell you everything about your OpenMPI installation. So here is just uh, the first couple of, of things that it shows you. Um, so the version number, where it was, blah, blah, blah. There's lots and lots of stuff. It will also show you all the plugins that are there, all the components. Um, and the frameworks that they represent. There's also a dash dash parsable version to it. So it's machine uh, friendly. So you can do nice parsing versions of it. So if you have automation, then you wanna make sure you have a certain feature in OpenMPI, you can. Um, and then we're gonna get into more in the next session because I'm out of time here now is there's a dash dash all option that talks about MCA parameters, which is how you tune OpenMPI at runtime saying, hey, I want you to use this value for this thing. You can pass in uh, lots and lots of things at runtime. How do you know what parameters are available? Oompy info, dash dash all, potentially with parsable and you can grep and said and look through things there. All right, so that's it for part one. Um, and we are, I'm sorry, we're four minutes over, um, but Kenneth, are there any uh, questions?
Yes, we have we do have a couple of questions related to building Open API. Um, one is why does it take so long for Open API to run the configure script, and is there something that can be done about that? <laughs> Good question. Um, I have to give a tongue-in-cheek answer first. You should see how bad configure used to be. <laughs> configure used to take three to four times as long as that. We spent a lot of time to optimize it. Um, the reason it takes so long is because it actually configures uh, a bazillion, I'm sorry, it, it, it compiles a bazillion things while it is poking around your system. Uh, particularly if you have a license-locked compiler um, so that every time you compile a file, it has to go get a license, do the compile, and then release the license. That can add to the effective overhead of what configure is doing. So it is running a bazillion shell commands of which a large portion of them are compiling and or linking uh, individual files. And we're testing just so many different things that that's why it takes so long. So I'm sorry, um, it's better than it used to be. Um, and uh, I guess we're trying to support coffee vendors because we want you to start configure and go off and get a cup of a cup of coffee and then come back. <laughs> okay, we have one more question related to um, disable DL open. So the configure option disable DL open and its implication for forked processes. Um, and the question is related to issues or problems that we're seeing with R MPI and the R MPI uh, package. Um, so, so I guess the question I is. I need a little more context for that. I guess the question is, what what kind of effect does configuring Open API with disabled DL Open have on forked processes? Could it cause problems? Oh, limitations? okay. Uh, yes, I don't think it's forked processes that are actually the issue. There is a a very subtle issue that comes in here that I will get into in a second. Here is a, a truism. Um, that is, I think, probably true for the vast majority of people on the planet. If you think you understand linkers, you don't understand anything about linkers. I have to say this to myself all the time. Um, so the, the disabled DL open, remember what that does is it slurps the components into the library itself. So libmpi, and for sake of simplicity here, let's say it's libmpi.so, it's a shared library. That actually contains all the plugins. Um, when you are using libmpi in a, uh, I'll call it a non-traditional setting. Uh, let's say that you're running an application and you actually dynamically open and load libmpi into your process. Um, that can be where things get complicated. So you're not just MPI running a straight plain vanilla MPI program or S running an MPI program. You're running some program that partway through decides to open the lib MPI library so that it can use MPI functionality. Strange, complicated things can happen there depending on how you open that library and then how that library opens its own plugins. There's things called public and private scopes with linkers. And so when you open something into a process, you can open into the public scope or you can open it into the private scope. Um, so if you open libmpi into a private scope and then openmpi goes to open its plugins, um, it can't see the symbols from the main MPI library and the components will fail because the components, uh, openmpi's components actually rely on symbols in the main MPI library. So the, the short version of this, <laughs> too late, uh, is that if you're going to dynamically open the MPI library, you probably want to do disable deal open so that all of the components and all of the core glue symbols are together in libmpi.so and they don't have to do a two-step thing to try and find each other in separate linker scopes, which may not work if they're private. I know that was kind of convoluted. If that person wants to email me uh, off list here, uh, I'd be happy to point them in the right direction. Okay, very good. Um, one more question. Um, about open MPI support for AMD GPUs, whether that's supported or not. I do not believe that we have OpenCL support um, or any AMD vendor specific support uh, for that. Um, I think we just have CUDA support. Um, that being said, uh, if you want that, please go talk to AMD and encourage them to come talk to us. We are a very friendly open source community. <laughs> 
Okay, good. And then another question, is UCX the only way of um, enabling GDR CUDA support in OpenMPI, or can it also be used with IB verbs? Uh, at the moment, in OpenMPI 4.x, um, there is limited CUDA support in what is known as the OpenIB BTL. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in the next session, but here's a spoiler. Uh, the OpenIB BTL is going away in OpenMPI version 5. Um, in OpenMPI 5 and forward, UCX is going to be the way for InfiniBand and Rocky support. Um, that has been Mellanox's preferred way of supporting InfiniBand for years. The OpenIB BTL is unfortunately kind of abandonware, meaning that it's pretty unmaintained these days. Um, we're not going to kill it out of 4.0.x or 4.1.x because that would break backward compatibility with people with scripts and things like that. Um, but Mellanox has not maintained it for years, so it's been very loosely community supported for the past couple of years um, because for the most part it just works. There haven't really been very many bugs in it that needed uh, you know, new work. But no new features have been added to the OpenIB BTL in a long, long time. So uh, the answer is today we do have limited CUDA support with the OpenIB BTL and the SM CUDA BTLs. Um, but in the future, it's going to be more UCX and uh, LibFabric is also gaining its own CUDA support. Uh, that's still taking a little time. They're doing stuff in the LibFabric community itself to support CUDA. Okay, one more question if we have time, Jeff. Or actually a couple. I'm good if people still want to hang on. Yeah. Um, is there any particular magic to build OpenMPI with best features of HPC X, Mellanox, and Fidivan solutions? Mellanox provided, provides its own build of UCX library and others such as FCA or HCall, but how to integrate them? Uh, that is a great question. I wish I had a, a, a definitive answer for you. Um, what I can do is look this up for the second session. That is a Mellanox question. I'm afraid I don't have that answer. Um, they do provide their own build of OpenMPI itself. Um, however, a lot of customers, uh, at least I know my customers like to, we, we ship them a version of OpenMPI, but because of QA and the corporate life cycle, it's usually a version or three behind what's on the open source website. Um, and so if you want to just go get the latest version of OpenMPI and compile it against the Mellanox libraries, um, it's generally just doing like with UCX equals this, with FCA equals that, with HCall equals that. Um, Yes, I don't have a definitive list of those. I, I think the best thing to do would be to ask Mellanox. It may actually even be included in their documentation too, because I know they take uh, quite a bit of effort to both ship binaries to people who want binaries, but also remain very compatible um, with upstream community stuff. So it may actually be in their documentation already. Okay, uh, we have another question that's somewhat related to a question I have myself. So the question okay. um, is, do you need to compile OpenMPI for every compiler that you use for the final applications? And the related question I have myself is, is there a way to, to build one OpenMPI to rule them all, in a sense, where you configure it in a way that it's compatible with any system you may use it on? So an OpenMPI that you package and then can roll out on any system. Sure. All right, let me, so those are related but different questions. So let me answer the first one first. So the compiler suites. Um, if it's a C application, um, you can probably build with any old compiler and it'll be fine. I know that's somewhat heresy. Uh, some people believe that GCC sucks and you can only get good performance out of Intel. Recent versions of GCC are pretty good. Intel's pretty great. Let's, let's be clear on that. The Intel compiler uh, is pretty great. It's also pretty expensive. Um, Re, you know, GCC 8, 9, 10, they're pretty great. Um, and a lot of what OpenMPI does does not require all those advanced features that you get for very expensive compilers because um, we're not doing giant. Um, the performance difference that you see if you compile OpenMPI with Intel Compiler Suite versus GCC may not be as noticeable as you think. Um, I'm not going to speak for either of those vendors, well, the community and the vendor, um, but you, you might be surprised. So if you have a C-based application, you probably can just compile against whichever C compiler you've got is your favorite and you're good to go. Fortran and C++ are a different 
issue though. Um, there is no Fortran ABI between compilers. Um, there never was in the beginning, and now it's just way too late. Um, Fortran compilers have gone off their own way, and they're never going to ABI, just in any kind of practical sense. So if you have uh, users who are using different Fortran compilers for their Fortran MPI applications, uh, I'm sorry, it's a lost cause. Your best hope is to just come, you know, have multiple different open MPI installations with different Fortran compilers. Um, C++ is a little less of an issue these days because we don't even build the C++ bindings by default anymore because they have not only been deprecated, but they have been deleted from the MPI standard. Um, that being said, they were very rarely used in any real world applications anyway, so it's not a big deal. But very similar to Fortran, uh, there is no ABI between C++ compilers either. So if you do have users who are using the MPI C++ bindings and they are using different C++ compilers, then I'm sorry, you're really just going to need to have, um, you know, different installations of OpenMPI with different C++ compilers. So um, that's really the, the gist of it. With C, you can get away with it if you want to. Uh, with Fortran and C++, you really can't. But remember that rule of thumb that I said earlier, it, it is easier if you are just using the same compiler suite as your application. So yes, it'll work with C, but it's still easier if I, I have an open MPI with GCC and an open MPI with ICC and an open MPI with whatever your favorite other compilers are. Um, yeah, I think that's the, the rule of thumb there. Um, now, the other question is, let's say I have four different clusters and each one of those has different interconnects and potentially different libraries. One of them has CUDA, one of them doesn't. Uh, one of them has InfiniBand, one of them has uh, Cisco US NIC. Uh, can you just build one open MPI on a shared NFS volume and share it between the whole thing? You absolutely can, yes. That was actually one of our goals. In most cases, that'll work fine. Um, in some cases, it won't just because of the practicalities of the different systems out there. So for example, let's say my four different clusters represent four different years of funding. Right, I bought each cluster, um, you know, I bought one of them in 2018, one of them in 2019, one of them in 2020, um, and yeah, that's three, but you get the point. Um, they might have different operating systems on them. So one might have Red Hat 7, 7.2. Uh, another one might have Red Hat 7.5. Another one might have Red Hat 8. Um, another one might have SLES, um, whatever. They might have different distros and things like that. That's where the real trickiness comes in. So, I, I, in, in HPC, the general rule of thumb is that homogeneity is awesome. Heterogeneity is hard, right? So it's not necessarily the open MPI that spans your clusters that's going to be the tricky part. It's going to be the heterogeneity between your clusters, not necessarily in the hardware, but in the software stack that's going to get you. Um, if you have multiple different clusters with, say, different hardware in them, but they're all otherwise homogeneous software stack wise, you're probably good to go. Um, your users can either just use different um, command line parameters or environment variable parameters uh, or file parameters to specify, oh, on this cluster, I wanna make sure to absolutely use InfiniBand. On this cluster, I wanna absolutely make sure to use USNIC. On this cluster, I wanna absolutely use PSM2, whatever. Um, so that's where the complexity comes in is the other heterogeneity uh, between it such that effectively, you know, while it's possible to build one open API that rules them all, it may be simpler in practice to actually still have multiple installations. And I'm sorry about that, but that's, that's kind of beyond our control because it's like, oh yeah, it's the same, except for these 10 different things over here that actually turn out to be really important. So that's just a practical reality of today, sorry. Okay, yeah, that's a very good answer, I think. Yeah. Um, so maybe two more related questions. One that was raised is about the GPU support. So GDR cannot work with the system UCX packages from the uh, Red Hat repositories. Do I have to enable CUDA support in UCX during the build? So I guess the question if is- I understand you know, that question. If, if you want to leverage uh, GPU support through UCX, you need an UCX able uh, build or CUDA able build of UCS. Yes. So 
you, yeah, you, you need both UCX and OpenMPI to support CUDA is what it comes down to. Yeah. So if you have a UCX install, perhaps from Red Hat or somewhere else, that does not support GDR, uh, then you need to go get your own UCX and install it with GDR support and then build OpenMPI against that one. Don't build it against the other one that doesn't have GDR support. Build it against the one that has GDR support. And that might mean a little complexity with your LD library path or whatever you need to do to resolve to get the right UCX at runtime, but just make sure you, you do that. Okay, and then related question I had myself, is there any negative effect of building OpenMPI with CUDA support, maybe in addition UCX as well, when you use it on non-GPU systems? So can you make an OpenMPI build that is linked with, or is where the CUDA support is enabled, and then use that without issues on a system that doesn't have any GPUs at all? Uh, so let me answer that in two ways. And I'm, I'm, I'm really wishing I had done a little more CUDA homework before <laughs> this seminar today. Um, in terms of correctness, there is no problem with that at all. Um, you should be able to run and still get correct answers, the same answers, uh, with the same OpenMPI installation on machines with GPUs and machines without GPUs. So from that perspective, let's say you have a cluster that is homogeneous uh, in terms of operating system, and maybe you even have one head node, but you only had enough funding to get GPUs for a portion of your cluster. This is actually a fairly common scenario, right? Like, oh, I got a 64 node cluster and 16 of them have GPUs because GPUs are pretty expensive. Um, so yes, you, you should be able to have one open MPI uh, for that entire cluster. And on those 16 nodes, it will do CUDA level things. And on the non GPU nodes, it should do non CUDA things. Um, there is one corner case that I need to investigate. I, I think the right thing happens, but I might have to bring this back to the second session um, that I, I think we specifically architected it um, for exactly this case, the, you know, I have GPUs only on a portion of my cluster that we don't actually link against the CUDA library because on those 16 GPU enabled nodes, you might have the CUDA libraries there, but you don't have the CUDA libraries on the rest of your cluster because you don't need them because they're not being used. Um, and so from open MPI's perspective, I'm almost certain that we actually DL open the CUDA libraries at runtime um, so that if we deal open it and find it and it succeeds cool we'll give you CUDA GDR kinds of things right um, but if we don't find it we're like okay well there's no GPU libraries here there's no CUDA libraries here so therefore I'm not gonna do any CUDA stuff I don't I don't I can't even tell if you have GPUs or not because you don't have the CUDA libraries here um, I don't know what UCX does in this case I don't know if they support that or not but I just know from our base open MPI usage, that is what works. So if you have to have two different UCXs, uh, I'm not sure. I'm gonna have to check on that. Um, I'm not involved in the UCX community, so I, I don't know offhand. I'm sorry, I don't have an answer, but Ken, if you could shoot me this question afterwards, I will make sure to have the answer for the next session. Okay, I'll send you a reminder. Um, Thank you. We have three more questions. Um, so one was actually cool. for Ralph that we missed earlier, um, where the question is about testing and benchmarking of UCX, whether there's um, a project available that facilitates that. UCX or PIMIX? Uh, PIMIX, yeah, sorry. Testing and benchmarking of yeah. PIMIX, yeah. Um, I, so unfortunately, Ralph had to drop at the top of the hour. He had a conflict of something that he could not stay on for. So uh, you're stuck with me. Um, I am unaware of that. Um, for the most part, PIMIX is just glue behind the scenes that most people don't even interact with. It's usually, you know, the man behind the curtain, you just type MPI run or S run or whatever, and magically your MPI stuff starts behind the scenes. Um, we, when people talk about performance problems, it's usually glaringly obvious that like, oh, I did MPI run, 10 minutes later, my job started. And that's usually at very high scale too. Um, if you're talking across 32 nodes or even 64 nodes, you're probably not even going to notice, no matter how many cores you got uh, on those 64 nodes. Um, so that's what that's what Ralph was talking about too. That at small scale, you're not going to notice whether it's PMI2, PMIX, uh, just a linear RSH behind the scene or SSH behind the scenes. You're you're not going to notice because it's too small to notice. 
we're only doing 64 of those, so what's it matter? Um, and, and I'm fudging too. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make a point here that it all very much depends on your specific system and your networking and all the library and file system support and all these kinds of things. But in general, when people ask us uh, like, hey, my startup seems slow, we typically tell them to turn on a couple of choice MCA parameters that show in OpenMPI the timing of what happened during job launch. Um, and I can ask Ralph to expand on that in the second session a bit, or more to the point, can you please take a note and remind me, uh, and we will have Ralph expand on that, going through some of the things that you go through. It's not specifically benchmarking, but it's more like uh, troubleshooting that uh, is available. Okay, yeah, I took a note of that. So the second to last question, is there a way to ensure that a given transport is used over another? Say wanting to use TCP BTL instead of RDMA if it is built with both. Yes, and I am totally gonna defer that question to the next session because I have a bunch of slides on that. So I'm sorry to defer your question, but that's there, it's a lengthy conversation and I wanna make sure to answer that correctly. Okay, yeah, we'll cover this in the second part. And then to wrap up the final question, um, let me find it again here. Last but not least, when are you going to clean up and update the documentation and the FAQs of OpenMPI? Oh my God, yes, this is, this is a very good question. And please let me turn this into an appeal for help. Um, we're engineers, um, we are not good writers. Um, and also we write code for a living. We are, just as with most open source projects, even professionally funded open source projects, we're terrible at writing documentation. We need help. There's a lot of good information out there uh, the FAQ has gotten pretty big and unwieldy, um, and uh, the man pages could use some love as well. We could really use some help uh, with this, particularly written with a user's perspective in mind, because part of the problem with what we write too is we write it from the developers. We're like, oh, of course, everybody knows this, and we make assumptions, and so sometimes it's not the most clear documentation. So. If you have some time, even if you have like one particular thing that you would love to update in our documentation, please contact me. Um, or if you have a student who is begging for work or so, I don't know, whatever resources you have, we could really use some help with the documentation. I am the first to admit that it's not necessarily the best organized. Uh, it could use some updating. Yes, I don't have a good answer other than to appeal to everybody for help. <laughs> Okay, I think that's very clear. Um, yeah, that wraps it up. I'm out of questions, and I think we're also out of time for this first part. Thank you very much, Jeff. And also, thanks to Ralph. Um, and we will be back in two weeks from now for the second part. Yeah, thanks thank you, everybody. everybody. Uh, we appreciate your time, and I, I thank everybody for hanging on for an extra half hour. I appreciate all the questions. <laughs>